Coldwell Banker and the Newport Bermuda Race both celebrated 100 years in 2006. Coldwell Banker Previews International is proud to support Racing to Bermuda, a century on the ocean. For 100 years, sailors have strived against each other, nature, and the oceans, pressing their boats toward a distant lighthouse. The adrenaline's starting to pump. Get this thing rumbling, let's go. That's kind of scary, huh? Threatened by black squalls, frustrated by flat calms, blasted by salt water, thousands of men and women have taken the challenge of living in small boats for days on end, finding their way safely across the trackless sea in boats both big and small as they compete in long ocean races between historic ports. We've got some nice pace at the moment. Obsessed by the hunt for favorable winds and Gulf Stream currents dueling bow to bow, they steer toward an island paradise, pushing hard because they're racing to Bermuda. Long home of the America's Cup and the New York Yacht Club in its hilltop mansion, Newport, Rhode Island has hosted Bermuda race starts for 70 years. The straight line course called the Rum Line crosses 635 miles of open water. Before the centennial Bermuda race in June 2006, the crews have three concerns. That's one. Another is preparing the boats. Safety is crucial to the organizers, the Cruising Club of America and the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club. This race puts a lot of effort into preparation and making sure that we feel good about the boats and the crews that we're putting out there. We also uh, take a look at the experience of all of the crews that are in the event. Most people leave here in a cold climate and they end up in paradise, and I, I think that's always the added attraction. Then there's strategy, and there's a lot of debate. As we get further down the track, the weather gets a little bit harder to predict. But basically, the route's going to be something like bending out away from Rumline, headed east. We're going to pick up the current about here, ride it down. And basically, as we come through here, the wind's going to shift. It's actually going to kind of force us onto the other board and then reaching into Bermuda. We really have to make a choice coming straight out of the start, whether we want to pick the eastern route or the western route. The divergence of the point of entry for the Gulf Street is so far apart and so radically different. What that ends up meaning is widely divergent routing solutions. So it's not something where you can, okay, let's see how it goes for the first 200 miles and then make a choice. We have uh, two possible routes to Bermuda. We've simply stated one the eastern route, one the western route. And there is some question among crew members as to which one is the better. We'll let you know in about three or four days. You know, I think we're gonna have to we're gonna have to make a decision pretty soon. Probably gonna be east, east. or west. <laughs> the tension doesn't dampen spirits. We've got a great boat, uh, a mild weather forecast, and I think all is looking good for this race. This being the hundredth anniversary of this race yeah. makes it really exciting because it is the quintessential ocean race. This is the one that's really kind of popularized the whole idea of ocean racing, I think, certainly in this country, and it's attracted so many international competitors that you have to believe that the influence has been throughout the, the rest of the world as well. The 30 years that we had won the race, back in 1976, is when we won it with Running Tide. Um, and it was interesting that this is also the hundredth year centennial of the race. Uh, for them to go together, we're kind of keeping our hopes up that this uh, we'll have the same luck we did 30 years ago. Racing the Bermuda race on the Ticonderoga, it's racing tradition. It's, it's honoring the boats of the past, and it is racing tradition. Classic Ticonderoga is one of 265 yachts that have come to Newport from around the world for the Centennial Bermuda race. On Friday, June 16th, the biggest fleet in the race's history gathers near the starting line, extending from the Coast Guard vessel Willow. We'll follow the race on eight boats. The 60-foot Pegasus, Ticonderoga, beautiful classic. Hercules, formerly known as Boomerang. Running Tide, fully crewed by professionals. Look like a hot new 52-footer. Kodiak is my berth to Bermuda this year. Pretty Palawan is a 74-foot cruiser with an amateur crew, and Selkie is one of the smallest entries at 38 feet. The biggest is a 98-foot Maximus from New Zealand. She's favored to finish first. If the wind's good, she might break the 52 and a half hour speed record. Maximus has a crew of 21. Little Selkie has only seven. 
Selkie skipper Sheila McCurdy is sailing her 14th Bermuda race. Selkie's a family project. Sheila's father designed the boat, and her husband and nephew are in the crew alongside a father and a son from another family. Sailing Pindar is Dee Caffrey. She recently completed a record single-handed voyage around the world. Oh, I jumped at the chance. I actually had the invitation to join the 100th anniversary race um, from Andrew Pindar whilst travelling back up the Atlantic before I'd even finished my voyage. Having had 72 feet to myself and now having 60 feet of boat with 15 people, it was terribly crowded, but uh, I'll, I'll fit back into my team role and uh, be part of the team to make it happen. I didn't even bother with a sleeping bag because I'd, I didn't use the sleeping bag that much in six months, so uh, three or four days to Bermuda, fingers crossed it'll be fine. Things are a little tense for Joe Hoops on Palawan before the cruising division start. Life jackets are required at the start and finish. What's going on with Ticonderoga? One minute to the starting gun and she's on port tack and the jib isn't even set yet. Okay, number two up. Now the jib finally goes up. In the confusion, one poor guy is left with the whole job. Come on, hurry up. Meanwhile, Joe Hoops gets plenty no, of advice. Okay. Don't go that way, though, Toby. Get down. Get down. Get, get down. down now. Get down now. What? Give him roll. Give him roll. I am. Let's Just push. kill some speed. Kill some speed. Go kill down. Drive now, Toby. Driving. Oh, no, no, hold it. Oh. Up. Here comes Ticonderoga down the line on Port Tack. The rules say she has to avoid everybody else. If Ty gets out of this without a collision or penalty, it'll be a miracle. Amazingly, she clears the starboard tack boats and pulls off a fine start. Nice. Palawan does okay too, nipping behind Willow's stern. I love the enthusiasm. The best way to calm a crew is fire the starting gun. Things are a little calmer now aboard Palawan. That was uh, one of the more tense starts I've had in many years. Many, many years. Uh, Scott France recovers from his close call. Ticonderoga is the epitome of the word sleek and classic. The 73-foot catch is long, lean, low, and heavy. She's all wood, from the tip of her mainmast to the gleaming varnished steering wheel, down to the planks in her breathtaking hull. Big Tie, as she's always been known, was designed 70 years ago by L. Francis Harrishoff, a son of the legendary Captain Nat Harrishoff of Bristol, Rhode Island. All yacht designers are artistic. L. Francis was a Rembrandt. He had a gift for making a boat look beautiful. In the 1960s, Big Tie set speed records and long ocean races. As new technology came along, she became a cruising boat that races occasionally. Scott France gives her all she needs, including lots of varnish and plenty of careful maintenance. Her equipment, like the small bronze winches, is as traditional looking as the yacht herself. As they trim the sails in, the crew learns that a classic yacht puts her rail under easily. This could be a wet ride. I wasn't quite sure your plan, Scott. One of the crew asked France about the start. He explains that once he's committed such a big boat to a tactic, he has to stay with it. Now, what you probably didn't realize is that we started very unethically. Very, very risky start, but we pulled it off. We started on port tack, no rights on the fleet. But fortunately, there was a hole there that we got through and pulled it off. We were lucky. <laughs> Let's call it that. I'll say. She may not break speed records anymore, but there's nothing classier than Big Ty as she thrust her bow sprint out into the Atlantic, bound for Bermuda. Big dip down, vein out. B bow down hard, we're in great shape. Bow down hard, hard. Help him out. You'd think with more than 600 miles to the finish, everyone would take it easy at the start. Just give it 15 seconds and we're on the win and racing. Not aboard Kodiak 2, my ride for this race. And on the win now. We're heading for the yellow buoy. We're racing. Close 
This is my seventh race to Bermuda, and I'm calling tactics in a very different type of boat from Ticonderoga. Close haul now, we're racing. Yep. You're late for line, up on the wind, don't come off. Close haul, wait up, wait up. Yeah, we're on. 37 seconds, these guys are early. On the wind. That's it, okay, these guys. We'll let we'll go above Nirvana. Have you seen Nirvana? 15. We're in great shape. Above Nirvana now. Let her go over you. He'll never get on the wind. 10, 9. Nirvana's gonna be over. Okay, we're racing. And done now. And there's Kodiak 2 on the right. A nice start. Okay. Listen to the radio. Yeah, we want to try and point here. On the wind. With the crew on the rail to reduce heel, Lloyd comes off the line fast, and we cut through the competition. It went perfectly because Lloyd and the crew did their jobs at the helm and sail trim so well. We charge into the lead of our division. We're in good shape. Lloyd Ecclestone chartered this boat to try and win the race, which he did back in 1998 aboard another Kodiak. With a 170 collective Bermuda races behind them, this has to be one of the most experienced and knowledgeable crews in the race. I feel safe, and I know we'll sail hard and fast. Keep it on the wind. Up on the wind, Lloyd, you're not gaining bearing. Hard on the wind for one more length and then we're clear. No. Okay, 180. Here we go, 180 coming down six or seven. At the mouth of Narragansett Bay, we pass Red Bell number four marking the end of the reef and bear off to what we think is the best course to take advantage of the Gulf Stream when we reach it. We won't have to observe another buoy for the next three or four days. R2 is fine, right? Little sheet on, Carl. Okay, we were past R4. We're right there. We're past R4. For other boats, it's a first-time experience. You know, I think it's been a dream for everybody on this boat to always do it. And for most of the people on the boat, it's our first time. Caldwell Banker managers and employees have formed Team Pegasus to celebrate Caldwell Banker's own 100th anniversary and also raise money for Habitat for Humanity. They get a good start and sail clear of the competition. This modern boat is an eye-opener for some of the sailors aboard. I've never sailed a boat like this before. Um, it, it's got, from my perspective, I've been out of it for a while, but what's beautiful about it is so responsive. Usually get, in, get on a big boat and things move, move slowly, it's not as responsive. And what I'm finding out about this boat is that uh, it's extremely fast and very responsive. A lot of fun to sail. There's our big competition right behind us, Boomerang, now owned by the Merchant Marine Academy out in Charter. Scott King, the Navigator, class of 1975 at Kings Point resident of Bermuda, and clearly they like the eastern course. Here's the problem. A big circular Gulf Stream eddy sits right on the rum line. Strategically, the question is, which way to get across the stream in the best weather 200 miles from now? We have six boats in our class heading to the east. We have seven boats heading to the west. On this boat, we've elected to take a westerly course, and we really won't know how that worked out for uh, about a day but everybody here is bought into it and feels good and glad to be on our way. Skipper Lloyd and navigator Dan Dyer continuously monitor the wind and Gulf Stream forecast on the internet and radio. It's all about wind. Wind fills the sails and creates waves. Strong, steady, prevailing winds kick up big waves. 
and they also make the water move as currents, which we can see in ripples. The question is how to find a favorable current. There are no buoys at sea. We're taught in math that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But when it comes to the ocean, it's usually not the fastest distance because of the currents. As you can see, if you go straight down the rum line here, you would not encounter favorable currents going across the Gulf Stream or right in here on the northern part of this cold eddy, you'd be pushed, pushed toward the west and down here pushed toward the east. So going right down the rum line would not be a good thing to do. Jennifer, what's the difference between a cold eddy and a warm eddy? Okay, a warm eddy is formed north of the Gulf Stream, circulates clockwise, has warm water on the inside and cool water on the outside. A cold eddy formed south of the Gulf Stream, has cold water on the inside and warm water on the outside, circulates counterclockwise. Mother Nature tells you when you're in the stream. There are patches of sargasso weed. Many Portuguese man of war with their tiny sails. And Bermuda long tails and other gliding birds looking for fish. The water's warmer there too, leaping from 65 degrees to over 80 in a few hours. Hot water is fast water. A thermometer is standard equipment. The water temperature has moved up to 72 degrees. Now the Gulf Stream, even though it's a wind-driven current, it goes all the way to the bottom. It's like a thin ribbon about 60 miles wide, and the currents peak anywhere from three to four, five, or six knots. A little current can make a big difference to a slow-moving boat. For the small boats, we tell them mostly to rely on the Gulf Stream, and that's the most important thing for them, since they only go a few knots anyway. Adding four, five, or six knots to their speed, it would make a tremendous difference. The stream's hot water can quickly breed dangerous squalls with winds as high as 50 knots. It's not just the wind, it's also the temperature of the water. It takes it from the warm area, which is down by the equator, up along the east coast of the United States, for example, for the Gulf Stream, and takes the warm water up there. And it's a Coriolis effect, it's called, which is a turning of the, of the Earth, because it rotates, it curves the water to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. If the waves are especially steep, you're probably in the Gulf Stream. Rough weather is not guaranteed. Atmospheric high pressure can flatten the stream. The wind is something that changes so quickly. The Gulf Stream is real stable, so my margin of error is small compared to the meteorologist's margin of error because, there, I mean, every six hours can be something different from what the, what the models are showing. So you know, a lot of times they say that the, the race is won or lost by 60 miles or from Bermuda, and I think sometimes that's the case if you're becalmed and you watch smaller boats go right past you. It must be very frustrating. For the moment, at least, the big boats are pulling away. Kodiak's chief competition is another 80-foot maxi, Hercules, formerly Boomerang. Choosing the easterly strategy, she's making almost 11 knots in this moderate breeze. The crew carefully watches a stack of instruments to analyze performance. Sails are trimmed and the rig adjusted to make maximum gains. Kodiak holds west and keeps an eye on Hercules. Well, we've been racing one hour now, and the big question is, how's our performance? We've gone about 12 miles from Newport, and off to leeward we see Boomerang, just behind a boat with a red spinnaker that's cruising along there. And based on our bearing, we look at the compass here to see whether we're gaining or losing. And we've gained about seven degrees on Boomerang, and if you look from the bow to the stern, it's about two degrees, so you can say we've gained about three to four lengths ahead, which is uh, a good sign. Nobody's more superstitious than a sailor. One good omen is a school of dolphins playing alongside. Some crews bring their omens along for the ride. This is our ship's mascot, Yoshimi. She's a Japanese fighting fish that we rescued. She was a table decoration at a regatta dinner. And we saved her, and uh, we're gonna keep her alive and take her sailing. And if the weather gets rough, we just put the lid on her bowl, and we hang her up. Let's get up the space, all. Palawan is one of the boats headed east of the rum line. Sailing farther off the wind than we are, they set a second jib called the staysail. Not all owners are at home on the foredeck, but Joe Hoops is happy to grind a winch. That looks good. Yep. Yep. They're perfect. Let's just settle down and hook some miles. 
Our plan is to continue down this track, which will put us into an eddy that heads down to the south uh, east uh, in the Gulf Stream. Uh, we will be probably at a maximum of about 60 miles to the east of uh, the uh, drum line. And then we're hoping that uh, the easterly winds that the weather forecasters have suggested might fill in, will in fact fill in, and make it a, a good trip down to Bermuda. Gluck Lick means lucky. On deck, everyone's feeling that way as they get their sea legs and some experience steering and sighting the competition. Down below, the navigator isn't so confident. As he reviews his charts and data for maybe the 50th time, he's thinking, which is the lucky side, east or west? Well, at least the sailing is perfect. The light wind is just the right angle, a close reach for good speed, and the ocean is as smooth as a sidewalk. It's fortunate for both Glucklick and that whale that it's over there and not about to be rammed by the keel. Veteran Carl von Schwartz has volunteered for the full-time job of cooking for Kodiak's crew of 21 hungry sailors. By the time we reach Bermuda, he'll turn out 240 meals. Ready for another one? The new watch prepares to come on deck and take over. The next watch is getting up. We change the watch during the day, every four hours, and at night, every three hours. No sleeping. I can't believe this is the Bermuda race. So, Roger, what are you checking out? I'm trying to read the sail number, but it's wicked hot. Yeah. Way down here. It's always great, very exciting to check in on other boats. And one of our navigators is checking the stats. Selke has chosen the western strategy. The GPS shows David Brown that a current is pushing the boat east. The crew decides to sail closer to the wind. Skipper Sheila McCurdy, David's wife, goes forward to take in the spinnaker. A small boat with a woman sailors a flashback to an earlier era. Before the first Bermuda race 100 years ago, few people even dreamed that amateur sailors would race sailboats in the ocean. In the 1905 transatlantic race, the boats averaged 166 feet in length, and the winner was a huge 184-foot schooner Atlantic. It had a crew of 48, most of them tough pros, commanded by Captain Charlie Barr. Then a feisty visionary named Thomas Fleming Day came up with a revolutionary idea. Amateur sailors could go out there and average boats. All three entries in the first Bermuda race in 1906 were 40 feet or smaller, and every sailor was an amateur. Before the start at Brooklyn, New York, Day's critics predicted disaster. Somebody provided funeral wreaths so the sailors could perform burials at sea. Everybody was shocked that one sailor was a woman. Thora Lund Robinson was criticized for being petite and frail, but she handled a wild gale, and when her boat finished off St. David's Light, she was at the helm. The Bermuda race made the sea a playground. A hundred years later, it's much more than a race. It's a biannual ritual. More than 45,000 sailors have raced down. 50 people have raced at least 15 times. And it's an outstanding family event. In the centennial race, there were at least four family members aboard 30 boats, over 10% of the record fleet. With these big fleets and a race course full of surprises, winning one Bermuda race is hard. Winning two or more is close to impossible. Only four sailors have achieved it. The first was John Alden. Alden won three times in the 1920s and 30s in boats he designed and called Malabar. These are some of the prettiest boats that have ever raced to Bermuda. One of Alden's crew was a young yacht designer named Olin Stevens, who went on to design more Bermuda race winners than anyone else, 14. He raced the Yall Durade with his father and his tussled-haired athletic brother, Rod. A big version of Durade, Henry Taylor's 72-foot Baruna, won in 1938 and again in 1948. Baruna and John Nicholas Brown's Bolero dueled for years. 
these sleek, powerful black yoles were a handful. One sailor said sailing Bolero was so hard, it was like hunting tigers. According to another sailor, anything that flapped on this yacht could kill you on contact. Finisterre set a record for all time, three straight wins from 1956 through 1960. Owner skipper Carlton Mitchell said he was lucky. Everyone else knew different. When you add a strong, stable, well-equipped boat, a skilled and hard-driving crew, and pinpoint navigation, that's a formula for success. Finisterre's fame attracted more people to the sport. Since 1958, each Bermuda race has had more than 100 entries. The race is not all glory. One boat went up on the reef and sank. Others sprung leaks and had to be patched up. The race's worst accident and greatest feat of heroism came in 1932. After the schooner Adriana burst into flame, Bobby Somerset steered his cutter Jolie Breeze alongside. As his rig sizzled, 10 men jumped across from Adriana while Charles Cosley bravely manned her helm. Cosley finally made his leap too late. He's the only fatality in Bermuda race history. Dick Nye and his son Richard won two races in their Carinas. Dick was in heaven when the wind blew hard and he had a good cigar. It was an all-family affair. One of the most popular winners ever, George Kumantaris, raced to Bermuda 23 times before finally taking the Lighthouse Trophy in 1996 aboard Boomerang. He told his competitors, don't despair, keep trying, and if you don't win it by the time you're 75, withdraw. At 72, he was the second oldest winner in the race's long history. Boomerang held the elapsed time record that was finally broken in 2002 by Hollywood's Roy Disney on his swift pie wacket. Back to the centennial race, the classic Ticonderoga keeps rolling. We've been so blessed with just magnificent weather. Fair breezes, about 12 to 14 knots. I think we've been averaging a little over nine knots or so for the duration of this trip, a little over 24 hours. We're very, very happy campers. Ty, tell me about your job on the boat. Well, it's tough. <laughs> Life is good. The miles continue to pass. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Will there be more wind tomorrow or less? The on-watch rides the rail as the off-watch slumbers in the embrace of lee cloths that prevent them from being spilled across the cabin. Nighttime on the Kodiak 2. Beautiful out here. Breeze is about 11 and we're going just over 11. Something like 112 miles in the first 10 hours of the race. The big question for all of us is where is everybody else? We know a lot went to Leward. We're getting low of the rum line, but we're right on track where we're going to be to get our X point. Sailed through the night here, just uh, switched to the code zero right around dawn and uh, coming up on the Gulf Stream, probably two hours away from two knots of current in the stream. It's uh, pretty smooth sailing up to now. two strategies based on position reports sent by transponders provided by Caldwell Banker. Kodiak 2 on the left and other boats head west after the start. Hercules, Pegasus and Palawan are in the pack that heads east. We've had a really nice night. With uh, 10 knots of wind we were doing averaging 12 knots. Uh, we have 54 miles to go to where we enter the stream. Uh, the stream is going to set us north, so we put in a uh, waypoint considerably south so that we will cross the stream in pretty much a, south, a straight line rather than having it be an arc to the north. The guys have done a great job steering with 
with just the uh, the route on the course as straight as an arrow. And uh, with a little luck, we'll be into the cold eddy in six hours. You can do a lot of Bermuda races and not see weather like this. The wind is about 10 knots. We're going faster than wind at 11 and a half knots, exactly to the point we want to go to. And while all the activity around here is trimming sails and trying to go fast and to try and analyze the correct way to go, you can't help but get a little mesmerized just looking at everything. And the cool thing about sailing is every 30 minutes, something's different. The wind's the same, the people are different, the sail trim's different, the sky, the clouds come, and it keeps you on edge. And for me, as much as I've been out here for many, many years, you never get tired of it. Of course, if it was drizzling and foggy and terrible, I might feel differently, but right now, it's absolutely perfect. This will be my fourth Bermuda race, and uh, growing up on the East Coast, this is pretty much the pinnacle of Corinthian yachting. Uh, if you do any offshore sailing, you grow up knowing about the Bermuda race, and you know even the years that have uh, swept the fleet with hurricanes and all sorts of stuff. And a lot of us have uh, fathers and uncles who have done the race many, many times. So it's a very big tradition on the East Coast, and it means a lot. Are we taking some big risks, or are we taking more of a safe course? Do you think? I think it's a safe course. Um, our weather guesser yesterday said it was a, a risky move. I disagreed with him, and I think most everybody in, on the boat uh, that was with me when we talked to him uh, disagreed with him. I'm real happy with the position that we're entering the stream, and it looks like we're set up yeah, for the route. I don't want to get up here. What's going on, Ben? Uh, we broke the mount for the alternator, and when that happened, or previously, the cooling hose for the turbo charger was leaking. It's uh, all supposed to be one piece, like this. We're going to have to fix somehow. Yeah, so we'll figure out some kind of a splint. You going to weld it? <laughs> yeah, a little spit weld. The band-aid is done. Got some stiffness to it. And uh, thinking that as long as the two pieces of metal are contacting each other properly in there, it's oh, provide enough uh, stability for the alternator. It should be all right. Well, the mental challenge, I guess, is uh, just trying to keep, just keep sticking to the mud here because uh, you never know what's going on with the other guys. You can't really give up. Just kind of sail your boat as hard as you can and see where it all goes. As the boats enter the thick of the Gulf Stream, there's plenty of sargasso weed catching on the keels and rudders. The sailors have to find clever ways to clear the seaweed. It looks better now. Don't fall over. I see a cloud and I'm heading for it. Did you see the color of the water? Yes. We must be in the stream. It's about as, uh, as calm as I've ever seen the Gulf Stream in, in nine Bermuda races. The wind starts to lighten and the boats slow down. This is Bermuda Radio, Bermuda Radio, Zulu, Bravo, Romeo. The forecast for more wind doesn't inspire much confidence. It's calling locally tonight. 5 to 10 becoming 5 to 15 southeast. Tomorrow, <laughs> south, southeast, 10 to 15 and Wednesday, southeast 10 to 15. So basically calling. Yeah, southeast 10 to 15. Becalmed, a sailor's worst nightmare. Here's Maximus back with boats two thirds her size. It may seem like we're not doing that great, but we got the biggest boat in the fleet right here. We got an all pro Maxi right over here. We got 280 miles to go, so as far as I'm concerned, the race is like the whole new race starts right now. Sailors go aloft and search a breeze. This high pressure system, it just keeps floating south. I think kind of what we did today is we just sailed up, all the big boats sailed up the high pressure system and stopped. Our decision early in the race to go east 
was conservative, and um, I'm sure the others in their decisions to go west will say theirs was conservative as well. But they gained 30 miles on us in doing it, and we're paying for that now. Just getting ready for Father's Day. Captain Ecclestone's sons, John and Lloyd, present well, him with some wrapped. gifts. I, I must have wrapped it, uh, a day, a day I wrapped ago. it in the car. <laughs> and this is Lloyd, thank you. Yeah. Look at this, isn't this gorgeous? A very nice you reminder of how much a family event this race is. I'm uh, the, the only uh, lucky person on uh, Palawan that uh, was able to write a Father's Day card from my dear family. So that uh, puts me in a superior and enviable spot to all these other fathers. <laughs> Unfortunately, those gifts don't bring much wind from Aeolus, the god of the wind. Zero point zero zero. It helps a little when the navigator says we're riding a three knot current toward Bermuda, even though we can't feel it on deck. Sailboats are great fun, as long as there's some wind. Now we're like a race car driver trying to compete without fuel. The crews keep up a steady stream of irreverence and jokes, but we know they're hurting inside because they also keep changing sails, looking for that one that will get the boat moving again. Down below we catch some sleep. Are they the same vision as us? What does that say on the side side? Nothing like seeing another boat underway. Jim Sykes' Bombardino crosses just ahead. Hey, hoist! Luck Luck keeps working to try and find more speed. Ticonderoga has an encounter with another boat. Right, the closer we are to the Bermuda, the closer we are to the Bermuda. And that's an important thing when you're trying to get the There's an old sailor's tale. If you have uh, Oreos after lunch, you'll have, you'll have breeze all afternoon. Do you see many birds get on boats? Uh, yeah, offshore you always do. No, it's at 12-4. They rest off. Uh, 12 victories. This is not going to be 13. <laughs> Little thrush. It's a good bird. Are we going to find Bermuda okay? I don't know. That's a problem. It looks... I don't see it. <laughs> Extremely important to keep the focus. You know, um, little things like even just putting suntan cream on or looking around at the other boats can take you away from it. Easy, just got to keep uh, playing with the apparent wind speed that we can make um, out of the little wind that is currently around. You can feel the frustration. Though this weather isn't demanding physically, the mental pressure is intense. I, I would have thought after a couple days people get tired and maybe not uh, as conscientious about you know, getting every, every knot out of the boat, but Everybody's working together to get as much as they can out of the boat, even though we've been out here for almost two days. Feels like it just te it's teasing you, but it doesn't quite get there. No wind, we're adrift. This is painful. I think our competition is right here and right over in here. Nirvana's back in here and we owe her a considerable amount of time. So we need to move the boat relative to these guys in here particularly. Kodiak made an impressive 260 miles on the first day, but only 60 on day three. George, you ready for it? The crew continues to change sails in search of elusive speed. Well, the dolphins are enjoying the day. And Ike goes aloft again to search for wind. That's what we got ahead of us. 
Time to alert the family on a satellite phone that will get to Bermuda a couple days late. On a wide, wide sea in a small boat, the frustrated sailors lose focus, keeping up morale with forced humor. At sunset, they search for the elusive green flash. The hope is the night will bring more wind. Oh, it's beautiful, beautiful. Just need some wind. Sailors can spend a lifetime on the ocean and never actually see the elusive and maybe mythical green flash. The only thing that's remotely fast is cameraman Rick Depp's time-lapse record of sunrise over running tide. Right now we are sailing around with the wind seeker. Hoping to go to the light one once we punch through some of these light air holes. But every time it seems that we put it up, the wind uh, dies off again and we go back to the wind seeker. Well, if we didn't know what the terms light and variable meant before today, we know now. Keep her going. Hmm? Keep her going. Keep it out? Yeah. No. That's drag. We don't get that thing inboard. Okay, hey, we're sailing now. The Bermuda race usually doesn't involve much fishing. It's called the Thrash to the Onion Patch because of its long history of gales, water spouts, and plain bad weather. One year a hurricane lashed the fleet, and the following entry was made in a boat's log. The watchword for today is survival. Sometimes the conditions have been like this footage of other ocean races inspired by the Bermuda race, including the Fastnet in England and the Sydney Hobart in Australia. Survival isn't the only problem this year. It's getting boat speed up over three knots. We don't really have a lot of options right now. We need to just continue, you know, following what little breeze we have. If it goes easterly or southeasterly, that'll be to our advantage. When they see they're even with Big Maximus, crews have to wonder if they've done badly too. Position reports on the internet offer no solace. I'm starting to hate those reports though, you know? <laughs> they, they, they never really give us the news that we want to hear. Everybody else is stooge and you guys are looking like heroes. <laughs> The part that's a little bit worrisome as far as the overall fleet result is the, um, the Alchemy and um, Bellamente, Bellamente, which took the, the other riskier route. Looks like it's had a pretty good payoff. And at least for distance from Bermuda, they have about a 40 mile hop on us with 290 to go. A lot can happen 290 miles, of course, but right now, they're looking like that was a, a risky move that paid off. Hopefully we're running again ahead of the high, which I can see behind us some wind in the sky, that um, uh, we can uh, do a real job here. Holy smokes, that's kind of scary, huh? Oh man, I've been out here with these. Squalls appear, but they're all bark and no bite. At least the decks are wet, and it chills off a little. The clouds stir the breeze. Finally, there's a bow wave and flying spray. After two days of misery, the wind is up, and the boats are sailing fast. Finally, the deck is healed, and the boats are back on their way toward Bermuda. Finally, the radio reports are cheerful. Finally, the light sails can be replaced with sturdier ones. Finally, the crews can stretch their muscles. Finally, the focus returns. 
Coming down, boys. Go. Finally, those wet sails come out of their bags to dry off underway. Everybody lends a hand. Finally, the speed's over 12 knots. And finally, there's a smile on the helmsman's face. Welcome to my world. Morale never flags on Pegasus. The crew is on a special mission. Asked if, if anyone would be interested in participating in exchange for raising money for Habitat. We uh, connected with Ned to be our skipper, and we asked Ned, who's a veteran of uh, a number of Bermuda races as well as other ocean races, we asked Ned to pull together a crew of people that would get the boat uh, to Bermuda not just safely but also competitively. There are many reasons to race to Bermuda. Why did I do the race? I wanted to meet some new people connect with Colville Banker people in a, in a different level than I do just as a sales associate. Um, wanted to go back to Bermuda where my, where my dad grew up as a child. Wanted to come back to New England where I grew up as a child 40 miles from Newport. There were just a whole lot of reasons that this thing worked. Given the opportunity and the amount of time we had to put the boat together, it's definitely a competitive boat. Um, you know, I think we learned a lot by doing our first race in, in the, the Block Island race and we learned that this boat doesn't like to go up, up, upwind in light air and as you can see right now it's we're about 45 degrees off the wind and just motoring along it's great. Way down underneath that big, uh... After 600 miles and four days of sailing Kodiak and Hercules are just a mile apart. At one point during the race they were separated by 120 miles we went west, they went east. Go figure. Now it's a sprint to the finish in anybody's race. Well, only 50 miles now to the finish line. The wind is still very light, but a little bit of good news. Out here on the horizon, we can see four other boats. We probably, uh, we probably owe them on handicap, but it really doesn't matter, because you do want to get to the finish line first in your class. Nice day, Bermuda ahead. Everybody's looking forward to the finish. We're almost close enough to Bermuda to smell the rum and the tropical flowers. The crew starts the final lunge to the finish, changing tacks often to stay between Hercules and Island. The crew put their backs into the handles that spin the big coffee grinder winches. They check sail trim often and steer carefully. It's as if they're finishing a 10-mile day race. Over in Hercules, the crew also works hard. They change jibs with the rising wind. There's nothing like a match race to get the adrenaline pumping. Lloyd Ecclestone is focused at the helm. The crew doesn't let up. Adjusting with every puff of wind, the island is in sight. Everybody will be glad to get to the finish, particularly after drifting for two days. Two degrees and get a little more speed. It'll be fine. 10-2, 10-3. From space, Bermuda looks lonely out in the middle of the Atlantic. The leader's now near the tiny fishhook-shaped island. St. David's Lighthouse has presided over finishes of all 46 runnings of what the Bermudians call the Ocean Race, as well as other races from Charleston, Annapolis, and Marion, Massachusetts. Now, St. David's Light awaits the lead boat. The first dot on the horizon turns out not to be Maximus. It's a mere 66-footer, Bellamente, owned and campaigned by Hap Fouth. He's from Minneapolis. While Maximus was drifting around east of the rum line, Bellamente found four and a half knots of favorable current far to the west. Like everybody out here, Bellamente wrestled with some problems. Besides experiencing frequent calms, including one near the finish, the crew had to stop and unwrap a fishnet from the keel. But in times of stress, they called on their bellamenti, that means beautiful mind, to maintain their patience and sense of humor. Bellamenti finishes Tuesday afternoon with an elapsed time 
a very slow 96 hours, 42 minutes, 18 seconds, almost twice as long as Roy Disney's record. Nevertheless, they're glad to be here. As lookouts on the lighthouse strain to spot the next boat, Hap Faust starts the celebration on Bellamenti. It's a long wait, 100 minutes in fact, before Alchemy, a 77-footer, finishes second. That starts the parade of big boats. Even they manage to seem small on the broad sea as they slip through yet another calm weather pattern. Most of them haven't had more than 15 knots of wind over the past four days, or even got their decks wet, except in the occasional rain squall. Just 61 seconds after Alchemy comes Captivity, a 76-footer hailing from Manchester, Massachusetts. Maximus eventually arrives. At one point, she trailed Bellamenti by 50 miles. She made up most of that and finished over two hours later. Three and a half hours behind Bellamente, but six minutes ahead of our arch rival Hercules, Kodiak 2 slips through the twilight and works around the reef to be the eighth boat to finish. Speed is king. When the corrected Let's time handicaps are, are computed, we end up 12th in class nine. Right there. Get this thing rumbling, let's go. We have 1.2 miles to the finish. We'll call it. Smile for the camera. Finally, the finish line for Kodiak 2. About eight, ten seconds. I mean, this is bearing 291. Stand by. In three, two, one, mark. Good race, buddy. Good race. Nice job. Hercules just six minutes behind. Sometimes I wonder whether the start or the finish is more complicated. Of course, the emotions are running high at both ends. All in all, a very good race for Kodiak, too. We did find some holes that were costly, but everybody performed well. We got here safely, and what a nice thrill to be in Bermuda. Yeah. Lucky Glucklick finishes after sunset amid a chorus of tree frogs. On corrected time, she ends up fifth in class nine, well back in the cruiser racer division. Hey guys, three, two, way on. It's finished! Obviously, this hasn't been a good race for the big boats. The corrected time winner of the cruiser racer division is this 40-foot sloop, Shin Fein. Built 40 years ago, she was very well sailed by a crew from New Jersey. The skipper was Peter Rebovich, along with his two sons. They won seven trophies in all. All right, here we go. Win or lose, everybody celebrates. Yeah. <laughs> Many boats are as close at the finish as they were almost five days earlier on the starting line. Selkie chases Emily in the last hour of the race. Sheila McCurdy's crew ends up 13th in the Cruiser Racer Division, less than four hours behind Sinn Féin. 635 miles, we're in a couple of boat lengths of Emily. A little sloppy. At the finish, we've taken Emily one more time. Great boat for boat race, up the wind. Selkie's crew has done consistently well over many years. It's Wednesday morning at uh, about 10 minutes to 9. We're about five miles from the finish line. We're beating. Uh, we've just spotted land. The crew is very anxious to cross the finish line and get in to meet all the, that are waiting for us on the dock. Big boats and small are now pouring in side by side. Thanks to the calms and confused currents, the fleet is all a jumble. Palawan's bimini top is put back in place under the tropical sun. And the wind dies yet again. Palawan drifts across. 
Ticonderoga storms across the line Wednesday night. Though it's extremely unlikely she'll be mistaken for another boat, the crew shines a light on the sail number. Big Tide did not do well in the final standings, but there were no complaints. If there's any place where sailors are at home on shore, it's Bermuda. For centuries, boats provided most transportation until cars and trucks were finally permitted after World War II. The beaches are famous, of course, and the local Bermuda rig is carried on these exciting fitted dinghies. The race boats make their way through lovely twisting channels to the Royal Bermuda Yacht Clubs and Marina at Hamilton, where the fleet is tied up. A total of 176 prizes are awarded. Some of the major ones carry the names of the race's founders and heroes that date back more than 60 years. They were handed out at the Governor's Mansion by a passionate royal sailor, Princess Anne. A trophy is only one reward for sailing. Sailing has so much to offer, all age groups, at all stages of people's careers. And all 2,600 sailors plus that. the hundreds of volunteers who made the race work knew they had accomplished something special. They all share the deep abiding love of the sea and the boats that have carried five generations of sailors through gales and calms. The smell of the sea, the feel of the wind, the roll of the ocean. Once you've been out there, you'll never get it out of your system.